I'm glad you could stay on news this. Now let's start with uh, the sad, sad story. As we promised, we return to revelations emerging from joint news investigations into the operations of the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority, established to coordinate development to bridge the gap between the North and the South. But it's, it's been bedeviled by alleged corruption, improper award of contracts, among others. Manasseh Azuria, when he reports on some travels which, according to an audit report cited by Joy News, suggest were wasteful and beyond the mandate of the authority. In 2012, management of SADA organized a trip for three officials to Turkey on behalf of some district assemblies. The CEO, Gilbert Sedu Idi, a minister of state at the presidency, Alhaji Mustafa Ahmed, and Mahama Shaibu, an executive assistant at SADA, embarked on this trip. This trip cost SADA some 226,000 Ghana cities. The trip, according to SADA management, was meant to facilitate sister city relationships on behalf of some district assemblies. An audit report on SADA states that the trip did not fall within SADA's mandate and did not bring any benefit to the authority. The report also says the 226,000 Ghana cities spent on the trip was not approved by the SADA board. The report recommends that Mr. Gilbert Sedu Idi should be surcharged with the amount. Joy News Checks also revealed that Cronum Investment Limited, the company paid over 84,000 Ghana cities to organize the trip, is not a travel or tour agency. It deals in ICT services, real estate development, and oil explorations, among others. Another unapproved expenditure on a trip, according to the audit report, was a trip to Birmingham and Berlin. Management of SADA paid about 70,000 Ghana cities to Casmet Seed Company to organize the trip. Joy News checks at the Registrar General's Department again revealed that this company too does not deal in travel and tour. It is into sale of seeds, construction of thefts, and agribusiness. The audit report also reveals that SADA could not account for about 14,000 US dollars when it sponsored three officials to the 68th session of the UN General Assembly. SADA CEO Gilbert Idi, Alhaj Mustafa Ahmed, and SADA board chairman Al Hassan Andani embarked on this trip. Mr. Al Hassan Andani has denied that the trip was to the UN General Assembly, as stated in the audit report. He told Joy News that SADA had a meeting in New York at the time the UN General Assembly was in session. He, however, admitted that there were issues with the receipts and they were being dealt with. For Joy News, Manasi Azore Arene reporting. Right now, the management of the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority is meanwhile questioning the basis for the allegations of financial malfeasance leveled against the authority in the audit report of 2011 to 2013. SADA officials say the issues raised in the audit report are not conclusive because they are yet to respond to them. The audit report, however, states from the observations during the audit uh, have been discussed with management and their responses incorporated in a management letter. Director of Finance and Resource Mobilization at SADA, John Kwakupum, has told uh, Joy FM the audit process is still ongoing and would not engage the media on it in order not to compromise the process. There were a couple of issues here. First of all, the audit is an ongoing thing because According to Kwakupum, they haven't received a final audit report. He also says they are supposed to be responding to a management letter that came to them. And he goes on to say they, have, they, are, provide, they are to provide a response to uh, the final report, and in his opinion, which will be produced and later become a public document. He, however, went on to say that he did not think that the whole mandate of SADA has been fully understood by the general public, hence the persistent negative publicity. Now, the SADA Director of Finance and Resource Mobilization also talks about the investment of 74 million Ghana cities at Stambik Bank. He said the account quick, was quickly opened following an external consultant's advice, but insists the funds are entered. Uh, there's definitely more on the story, and we will bring you up to speed on all our platforms. But, well, uh, we're, we're trying to get in touch with uh, Professor Ken Atifa. And you recall also that there, were, there was an issue of conflict of interest when it came to this because uh, 
and Danny, who is uh, Al Hassan and Danny, who is board chairman for SADA, is, is also a CEO for Stambic Bank. And questions were asked as to if it wasn't conflict of interest for SADA to hold an account with Stambic Bank. Minister, uh, Minister of Communications, Mahama, Minister of Information and Relations, uh, Info, Information and Media Relations, rather, Mahama Yarga has mentioned that uh, if everything is intact, then there is no conflict of interest in the case of the SADA holding a Stambic Bank account with, uh, holding a Stambic Bank account. But then again, uh, Professor Kenatifa has said he thinks otherwise. We'll get in touch with him and uh, find out exactly why uh, he thinks so. In the absence of that, let me just remind you, you can share your thoughts with me on our social media platforms. Join us on TV, on Facebook, and on Twitter. On my personal handle, Kimini Amano on Facebook, or tweet at me, at Kimini. Also ahead, we deal with traditional medicine. We understand that practitioners of traditional medicine are to benefit from a three-month training program on new methodology in handling infectious disease. Then also, we are in NPP. The whole team uh, is, is, is pitching camp ahead of... Did I say we are in NPP? No. I mean, we, we are in Tamale, ahead of the NPP uh, National Delegates Congress. We pitch, we've pitched camp there since Monday, and we'll go there this morning and bring ourselves up to speed what's been happening. And that's ahead in the program. I'll be right back. Don't go away. Thank you very much for staying on. Let's talk traditional medicine now. And uh, registered traditional medicine practitioners are to benefit from a three-month training program on new methodology in handling infectious diseases. The training comes in the week of the outbreak of the Ebola virus in parts of West Africa, which according to officials could spread a traditional medicine practitioners who are most likely to receive patients are not taught on the proper procedures in handling infectious diseases. Now, 70% to 75% of Ghanaians rely on herbal medicine for their primary health care. The continuous professional training program by the Traditional Medicine Practice Council is to promote and ensure quality of service and health care to the public. Let's get more on this. I have with me in the studio Togbiga Iyaka the Force. He's registered traditional medicine practice practitioners council thank you very much Togbiga. i hope i got the name right <laughs> yes, you have. You Yaka, have. the fourth yeah. right so tell us more about this training what, what form is it taking yes thank you very much um i would like to correct right. uh, a statement mm. in fact the training program is not intended to equip our practitioners in the wake of the Ebola virus uh, issues. But it is a program that has been scheduled since the beginning of the year uh, to be ongoing mm. you know, to the end of the year. It's just a matter of coincidence that uh, this Ebola uh, fever issue has come up. Mm. And so it will help them also be protected against the deadly virus. Yes, so this is something you do all the time. This three-month training is something you do all the time. That's right. I see. But this is the first time we are hearing of it. So uh, it, it, yes. it, it only sink, sinks into the <laughs> fact that you want to protect your members also from contracting uh, the virus should it come into our country. Uh, well, uh, I think it's a, a good opinion to hold. But importantly, uh, as part of our mandate, as a regulatory agency, the Traditional Medicine Practice Council, uh, regulates training of our practitioners. In other words, they review, develop curriculum as to be uh, administered at the training institutions, be it the university or uh, tertiary, uh, other tertiary uh, institutions or private schools. And so we are also, like any other professional body regulatory agency, conduct these continuing professional development programs for our practitioners and this uh, regular or yearly affair mm. and this year's one has been planned to start from tomorrow and end somewhere in November okay. this year and uh, the traditional medicine practice council 
uh, came into being since 2003. And the training programs have been instituted since 2008. Mm. And we've been running the training programs uh, since then. Mm. But it is important for us to also know that it is not the TMPC alone that organizes these programs. We do so in collaboration with uh, uh, relevant stakeholders. And sometimes we accredit NGOs okay. or other training institutions or facilities to take up the training programs uh, as we plant them. How, how many yeah. members are going to receive the, this training? Uh, as many as we can accommodate. Mm. In other words, for now, our target is the practitioners who are already mm. registered with us okay. or with the Ministry of Health or have the Ministry of Health license. Mm. But we also look forward to receiving people who might, used to, who might wish to come on board and uh, possibly uh, get registered after mm. the training program. So what sort of training do they get on another three-month program? Uh, it isn't a three-month program, uh, so to speak. Because I see. It's, the not, program, it's not three months. Not at all. It's a program that has been uh, scheduled so that um, some might be concurrent. Mm. Uh, programs might be held in Accra, Kumasi, Tamale, or other view. But it is spanning from this month, that is tomorrow, mm. till November. Because mm. we are talking about over 20,000 practitioners. 20,000 uh, yeah, Including our indigenous herbalists, mm. our alternative medicine practitioners. These mm. are the acupuncturists, the mm. chiropractors, and what have you. Especially the faith healers, these uh, prayer camp operators, are also going to benefit. Uh, okay. as well as our manufacturers, those mm. who manufacture the products that we see on the market. So, so what are they usually taught at the stream? Uh, at this time round, we are looking at infection prevention and control. Okay. Uh, the objective is to guard them against possible infections from their clients. We know we are grappling with TB, we are grappling with HIV mm -hmm. and other infections. And looking at the background of our practitioners, uh, it will be very difficult for us to be sure uh, that uh, they will guard themselves against getting infected mm. from their clients. Mm. You know, the conventional health practitioners are taught the uh, ways and means to prevent any infections, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when they deal with mm -hmm. patients. Mm -hmm. But our practice is an indigenous one, mm -hmm. except in the case of the medical herbalists who are trained in Kumasi right. and the other practitioners who are trained elsewhere, outside mm -hmm. Ghana. But majority of our practitioners are indigenous practitioners and who need to be equipped, uh, particularly in this um, area of infection control and prevention. Mm -hmm for obvious reasons. Mm. Uh, so yes. are we going to see them with some gloves and some, you know, protective oh, oh yes, work? yes. In fact, this topic, this infection control and prevention mm. has featured uh, in our training programs since 2008. Mm. We have resource persons from the Ghana Health Service. Mm. And these are, uh, you know, you can imagine, uh, well-trained practitioners mm -hmm. of medicine who uh, put them to the requisite knowledge okay and so they bring on board all that is required you know to prevent uh, or pr to prevent infection transmission from clients and there are other topics where we get there we'll talk mm. about that. O over the years you've held this training program what has it what has it yielded um, the impact is huge mm. it has impacted positively on quality of care mm. Uh, confidence in the practice uh, has been on the increase mm. and uh, particularly uh, the code of conduct of our practitioners mm. have been as expected uh, unlike the days when the training programs were not in place and we're doing things as a how uh, in quotes we acquired it from our grandfather or mm. our grandmothers uh, this time around things have changed uh, they are taught how to uh, relate with their clients, they are taught how to relate with their own supporting staff and how to even handle the products and exact as maximum information from their clients as possible as they uh, apply themselves to treating them. 
Right. Now, uh, there's more to talk about with Tog Wiggins, but I, I, I'll, I'll take a quick break. When I come back, we'll continue the conversation on traditional medicine. Don't go away. Thank you very much for staying on Newstick's desk. We're still speaking with uh, Togbiga Yaka, the force. He's registered traditional medicine practitioners council, and he's also Avafia Mega. Is that it, Togbi? Yes. Okay, for the Fia Afifa, <laughs> Fia Afifa traditional area. Thank you very much, uh, Togbi, for. Uh, your time here but are we it says that we are looking out for new methodology in handling infectious disease share with us this new methodology yes thank you that is why i have some concerns because we haven't spoken about uh, having new methodologies regarding infectious disease control not I at see. all it might be um, uh, misinformation we are only looking at or maybe it was also miscommunicated uh, well, I don't know where they got this from, but if it was from the 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 lunch mm. as conducted yesterday, then we handed out speeches, mm. and so they could have gotten all the material information there from. Mm. But importantly, there's no way traditional medicine practitioners and their regulators talking about new methodologies okay. of infections or whatever. But we're only looking at the infections control and prevention. Very well. As far as our practitioners are uh, engaged in the business of mm. alternative health care. And uh, as I already said, our people were not trained in any structured sort of program. Mm. And so all that we are doing is more or less indigenous. And right. it's important that our colleague health care, uh, conventional health practitioners, they have some uh, come know how board, when it comes yes, to that as bring, well. Uh, yeah, Let's talk about us. general traditional me medicine practice here in the country. Yes. Um, th there is always the issue of the fact that one medicine can cure too many diseases. <laughs> it, it, is, is that <laughs> what traditional medicine is? It can do everything and almost... Exactly so. I see. I speak as a pharmacist. Mm. That's my background. Okay. Apart from being a herbalist, mm. an indigenous one. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether you've used or come across this medicine called Atwood Bitters. I think I know it. It's on the market. You look at that label, made somewhere in the UK, has a whole lot of indi indications, you know, written on it. Mm. One may ask, oh, if you in the UK, can mm. we have this uh, situation? The, the answer is yes. You look at our antibiotics. Mm. We don't use ampicillin just for the sake of the discussion for only, um, let's say, infections. Mm. Uh, of one particular part of the body. We see for um, infections of the chest, mm -hmm. of the uterus, and hold a view. And so that question most often beats my mind, uh, my imagination because mm -hmm. I wonder why someone would think that a plant or a herbal medicine could not treat as many medicines as the manufacturer mm -hmm. or the producer, uh, you know, attaches to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, it depends on the components of the product. Even okay. if the components were mono component uh, or a single component, mm. it is possible that component could take care of as many conditions as the literature could reveal. I see. Yes. I see. But o o over the years, we've had people who've come up with all sorts of things as uh, dealing with all sorts of sickness. My, my question is, this is your trait as, as a council. This is, this is your trait. And if you have other people who are, um, what's the word, m m marring the, the, the image of, of that trait, then yeah. you should have concern uh, as well. What is it that the council is doing in that regard? Uh, yes, thank you very much. You know, governments over the years have recognized the importance of herbal medicine mm. or traditional and alternative medicine in general. And so Ghana has been part of committee of nations that, you know, uh, signed on to a lot of treaties, mm. declarations, and what have you. Mm. The object was to, uh, in the long run, mm. mainstream both the traditional and alternative medicine and the conventional health medicine. Mm. And as we speak, we have about 15 pilot centers 
uh, health, uh, health biomedicine centers in our public institutions across the country. And uh, I think it will be scaled up very soon. Mm -hmm. But what I was driving at is the fact that because the relevance has been so underscored, mm. uh, measures are being put in place to improve the quality or standard of care or service as provided by the practitioners. And one is the establishment of the policy wing at the ministry. The other is the uh, putting together all the practice groups under uh, one federation or the other. And importantly, the establishment of the uh, Traditional Medicine Practice Council uh, subsequent to the passing of the Traditional Medicine Practice Act or the law of 2000. Mm. And so at the end of the day, I think the goal is to have a quality traditional medicine care. Mm. And so the mandate of our traditional medicine practice council is to implement the law mm. as I've given you. Okay. And you know put in place structures with a view to making sure that quackery charlatanism mm. is reduced to the barest minimum. Mm. And so our concern is that we should have a quality mm. uh, very competent practitioner. Right offering very quality mm. service as mm. far as traditional medicine is concerned. Mm. But, but I'm, I'm very sure that um, the council has its own thoughts when it comes to the Ebola virus. We'll talk about it uh, after we've, we've spoken briefly with Professor Ken Atifa. You recall that I was telling you earlier about uh, our serialization of the sad, sad story, an investigative report by Manasi Asore Awone. And, um, Professor Ken Atefa is acting dean of the Central University Law School. He's joined us on this matter. Thank you very much, Prof, for joining us here on News Desk. You're most welcome. Mm. Prof, you, in, in your opinion, you, you see uh, the fact that SADA holds an account with Stambik Bank, Bank as uh, a, 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 some sort of conflict in the role as far as Al Hassan and Dani is concerned. Uh, explain this to us further, Prof. I'm sorry, I, I heard your preface, but I didn't hear the question. I was asking that you, you, ex, you explain that opinion with us. Yes, yes. I share the view that, uh, I mean, I hold the view that because conflict of interest is about putting your private interest and your public obligations or duties in, in collision, and because the law requires under Article 284 of our Constitution, that a public officer shall not put himself in a position where his personal interest conflicts or is likely to conflict with the performance of the functions of his office or his duty. Um, it behooves any public officer to make a conscious effort to avoid even the appearance of a conflict of interest. Now, in the instant case, you have a situation where the chairman of the board of Stanbic Bank, or the CEO of Stanbic Bank, sorry, is also the chair of uh, the SADA board, the chairman of, the, of SADA. And it would seem to me that um, whether Mr. Andani recuses himself from the decisions affecting SADA or affecting the bank in the interface between the two entities, he is in a conflict of interest situation. Recusing himself is not sufficient. That has not even been presented as an argument, but it is a, he's a, a man I personally respect. He's a friend, and um, you know. But I think that this is one of those instances where uh, public officers may inadvertently act in a manner that clearly conflicts um, with the law. And this, I believe, is one such uh, instance. Prof, uh, on the other hand, the Finance and Mobilization Department of SADA said the money at Stambik is intact. Uh, Information and Media Relations Minister also said, well, if if all the if all due process was w w w all due process was followed uh, in opening the account to Stambik and nothing has gone wrong, then of course we we, we can we can say that there was no conflict of interest. How no, do you view no, this? No, no, no. That, that is an entirely different argument, and it misses the point about the essence of conflict of interest. Conflict of interest is not equal to stealing. It's not equal to, um, um, you know, misappropriating funds. So that the question of whether something um, has gone amiss, something has been taken, everything is intact or not intact, that's not a right. What arises is simply 
whether or not there is an appearance of the personal interest of a person colliding with or conflicting with the public duties of the person, such that a potential or an apparent or an actual conflict of interest may be occasioned. In this instance, you have a person. Mr. al Andani is a public officer or a public official by virtue of his position as chairman of the board of SADA. But Mr. al Andani is also CEO of Sambic Bank. Now, when the two positions come together, mm. the two interests, that is the public interest and the private interest, are clearly in conflict and any and so when the bank then holds the funds of um of, of sada you know becomes the guarantor i mean the the um yeah hold the, the funds of sada then the appearance is palpable it is not the allegation is not that he has stolen money the allegation is not that he has misappropriated funds at least that's not what i am saying i am simply saying that by virtue of Article 284 of the Constitution, he was not to put himself in a position where his personal interest, that is his investment in some big bank, conflicts or is likely to conflict with his duty as a public officer, a fiduciary of SADA, to serve the public interest, your interest and my interest, in a manner where no iota of self-interest could be perceived to have in, I mean, uh, for the self interest or advancement could be perceived to have uh, inured to him. It seems to me that he is in conflict if, by virtue of the two uh, positions that he held simultaneously and the placement or the lodgement of the status fund in his bank, you know, the potential for his pro the proper discharge of his public duties uh, could be affected. And, and, and if you look at best practices around the world in governance, I mean, a conflict of interest is just when, you know, your private interest is in conflict with your public duty and uh, of professional engagement. And there is simply no way, in my view, of, of, of um, concluding otherwise. So those arguments that nothing has been taken, it's neither here nor there. The argument that, you know, an audit has been mm. done and everything is fine, it, it misses the point completely about the nature of conflict of interest. And by the way, mm. the essence of it is to ensure that public officials act with integrity, that people do not have the opportunity to even question right. that there is nepotism, that there is self-dealing, that there is self-interest at stake, and that a public officer would not have to weigh. And if you ever have to weigh, then you must weigh the public interest over the private interest, the public duty over the private interest, so that you ought you constantly subordinate your private interest. And, and I think it is clear, mm. if we raise the bar, if we appreciate that, you know, the state is a jealous entity. The state is saying, you shall have no other interest before me. But the state, the state also knows that as a private human being, as a private person, surely you have interest. You were a businessman before it asked you to become a public uh, officer. Right. To share it wants to tap your expertise, but it doesn't want you to commingle your interest as a person with your private, uh, with your public interest as a, as, and your public duty as a public officer. Prof, so what sort of consequence does this come with, if, if there is any at all? Oh, well, I mean, you know, that is one area where our country is a little, there's a bit of a deficit. Um, I know that the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice has come up with some guidelines on conflicts of interest which have placed before Parliament, and um, you know, it, 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 is, it is strongly advocating to see that it, it is passed into law. There is, at the moment, apart from this constitutional uh, provision and a few other, um, um, you know, uh, legal provisions in the in the criminal code here and there, there's nothing specifically making uh, conflict of interest a crime. Um, and so, unless the conflict of interest also veers into other areas where, for example, healing is founded, healing is uh, established, then um, it, is, uh, it is an instruction that you deal with at trial. But of course, trial has dealt with conflict of interest 
and make recommendations. I remember in the case of the, when, when I was at the Shrag in, I think, the early 19, I mean, in the 1980, 1998, 99, we investigated the conflict of interest situation involving the MP for Fondong um, and Dopier, his own company. He, he was the MP, he was on the board, um, the, you know, the procurement board and his own companies were applying for, um, what they call it, applying for contracts, mm. and they were awarding the contract to his company. They were doing a shoddy job, but the company, I mean, the assembly was basically uh, approving everything. At the end of the day, the commission recommended that he should be banned from holding public office for a number of years. And uh, the National Democratic Congress Party, whose candidate or whose uh, yeah, candidate he was, he had stood on their ticket for MP, did not fill him the next time round. And I think that there was another one in Provence, I think, a DC for uh, for an hour or so, mm. uh, somewhere in the blue half of region, where he had also he was also found to have been in a clear conflict of interest situation. And again, the commission's recommendations were obeyed by uh, I think the NDC government at the time, and um, he was not uh, uh, fielded for public office. Mm. So there are consequences, not necessarily criminal, but an adverse finding that someone has engaged in conflict of interest. Mm. Has, um, broad-based implications. And if it's done in, in an employment context, of course, then the person can be terminated. In, in, in other words, this is one of those cases where Shraj and other institutions alike could be proactive in. Oh, yes. Indeed, it is Shraj that bears responsibility for investigating conflicts of interest uh, in Ghana, um, I think under uh, Article 218 of the Constitution, if I, my memory serves me right. Um, the, it is the Shraj that has responsibility for investigating it and all public officers under um, uh, chapter 24 of the constitution where they make disclosures about their assets and all of those they do, they do so uh shrug is the custodian and shrug is the one that investigates allegations of uh, conflict of interest and non-disclosure um, of assets for example prof thank you very much once again professor ken atefa is welcome. acting dean of the central university law school but let, let's quickly wrap up on our on uh, conversation with Togwi Yaka the fourth who is registrar for the traditional medicine practice practitioners council and uh, we're dealing with the traditional medicine practitioners who are to benefit from a three-month training program on methodologies in handling infectious diseases now that the training Togwi Ga tells us um, will run from now till November across the country so we got, yes. I apologize, we had to break into our conversation. But I was asking I that. that I'm sure that as practitioners, you, you have your own thoughts about the Ebola virus. Share with us. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Uh, for us, well, I speak for myself. Mm. As an indigenous traditional Muslim practitioner, I don't think I have an idea as to what the Ebola virus is. Mm. We may have it in a form that is ethnically known okay and uh, for that reason we may have a different name for it okay so not until um, I get the ethnic name mm. for the disease I don't think I have any much thing to say you haven't started looking into it uh, not yet as, as, as a council you've not looked into it uh, we don't deal with the diseases per se we deal with the practice the mm. offering of care whether it is in a chemical uh. service shop uh. where they are offering herbal medicine products uh. for the treatment of diseases. Or it's a herbalist who in whose practice is offering plant-based or animal-based products for treatment of diseases. Or where it is in a spiritualist home uh. where they are offering uh, treatment uh, to take care of our emotional diseases. Uh, for us, we only want to ensure quality of care, promote quality of care. Mm. I don't know the day. I, yeah. I, I, I get it, but what, one would think that as, as an, a council where you have traditional medicine practitioners, mm. and, 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 and now we, we have those who have formed, who, who have come up with clinics and all that. Yes. And if there is a situation like this, we would want to those who would want to resort to traditional medicine should mm. have the opportunity to do so. And it's only, after, it's only when the council looks into issues as this that we can be sure that we can tend to traditional medicine. But it looks like traditional <laughs> medicine is taking 
the back seat? <laughs> not at all, not at all. Uh, we are all interested in making sure that our practitioners are equipped with the skills and the knowledge about preventing infections. You see, I'm saying, talk 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 I'm, I'm saying this because yeah. um, we, we've heard how traditional medicine has managed to uh, at least tackle the symptoms of HIV and AIDS. This is a disease we have been told has no cure. You can only manage. Yes. And so when we, we come to similar uh, ailments, yes. we, we expect that traditional medicine will come to the fore and, and, and help those who would want to resort to uh, traditional medicine. 70 to 75 percent of us here resort to yes. traditional medicine. And, yes. and I, I, I'm not impressed that you're not looking <laughs> into it. Uh, well, I think it is too early for us to say we are not looking into it. For all you know, mm. we have cures for it, uh, depending on the ethnic background that you find a practitioner. Mm. But I'm yet to get any evidence to suggest that when you go to the Ashanti region or the Cape Coast region or in the Volta region or in the north, they have treatment for it. And so we don't want to... Um, take any risks. So mm -hmm. we just want to pr uh, protect our people mm -hmm. from contracting the disease should any uh, patient with that disease uh, report at their facilities. Mm -hmm. And you know Ebola virus disease wouldn't be different from HIV, wouldn't mm -hmm. be different from um, TB, wouldn't be different from any contagious disease. And so we only want to build their capacity to be able to identify what risks they are looking mm. at and how to prevent uh, they themselves contracting it or their supporting staff contracting it so that immediately you realize that these are beyond your competencies. Mm. You just refer it to the next person or especially the government hospitals. Mm. That is where we are looking at. If, if, if we hold all the other things constant, yeah. can we be sure traditional medicine could be um, not necessarily a panacea to the Ebola virus but could it tackle it? Oh, yes. In fact, you see, what I wanted to drive home strongly is the fact that there are diseases that we see uh, with similar symptoms. Mm. I wouldn't say it is Ebola virus for sure. Mm. But there are diseases that manifest in the manner that Ebola virus does. Okay. And practitioners are able to take care of it. I'm very careful in giving you straight answers because of the name Ebola virus. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would like to say that we have treatment for diseases that will manifest uh, particularly the bleeding from the openings and the general mm. malaise or whatever that accompanies the disease. That one, I can assure you, we are comfortable and we are taking care of handling it. Mm. But whether or not it is Ebola virus, that is why I don't want to risk any, uh, you know, uh, I see. Uh, talk, talk again, it's been yeah. a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Talk bigger. Okay. Yaka, the force, is registrar at the Traditional Medicine Practitioners Council. We've been talking traditional uh, medicine. Let's move up north to Tamale, where the New Patriotic Party is getting ready for its National Delegates Congress in Tamale. You may well know that over 5,000 delegates are expected to elect national executives to stay affairs of the party ahead to see affairs of the party ahead of the 2016 polls now some delegates and candidates have arrived in tamale already and imana lanta has joined us over the telephone hello ima hello kevin uh, what's new today well um today we spoke to Osiko Japa, who also told us about we were speaking to him on uh, today's uh, my panel on today uh, on a, on the am show and he was telling us about a lot of things and um, the challenges she's gone through to get this far. You know, she's the women's organizer, the incumbent women's organizer who mm. is going for seeking for re-election. And so she and the other other contestants uh, are also saying some negative things on air against her. And she she was we were we asked whether she could be a instead of a, a political uh, game. So somebody might want uh, her to uh, be asked. Is is she in Tamale now? Yeah, she's in Tamale. We, we got her uh, this morning. And she's in Tamale, and she's doing all her groundwork. Be frank with you, she's been moving from every corner to get the people or to uh, rally the people behind her so she can win her. Really, she believes that she's done enough. She's done 
uh, a lot for okay. the party. She's done a lot for women in, in this uh, uh, great nation, not just the NPP, but the great nation uh, of ours. She believes she's done a lot for the children. So uh, she believes her track record will set her uh, on, on the road to, to victory. We're just a couple of days away from the big event. Tell us about mood now. How's it changed? Well, now the, 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 the tension is now building up a little, and people have started, the enthusiasm has really uh, uh, gone up a bit. The, the only thing, I guess, that uh, made, brought a bit of um, uncertainty uh, is uh, the news of Japan's uh, 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 accident. And Everybody seems to be worried. Everybody seems to be looking for information. I think the NPP um, executives that are here trying to make sure everything goes well um, were also looking for information, and nobody seems to be getting the information. Information is very scanty. Um, they keep trooping to us just to find out whether we have heard something and what the latest news is on the accident. So it's, it's, it's a bit uh, worrying here, and the information seems not to be coming probably as to the update on what has happened to, on the accident. But you know, uh, the, the enthusiasm has really gone up and we have now seen people riding on bicycles in the NTP uh, colors. We have seen people sitting around and wearing the NTP colors, which wasn't there uh, from Sunday when we came here. Only this morning we realized that people have started wearing those shirts mm. and wearing uh, the t-shirts and everything that, that has the NTP color. That's, that's what is going on. I, mean. I see. Now, let, let's uh, find out how many people have made their way there already, as far as the delegates, uh, the, the, those who are vying for the, for the position are concerned. Well, the information I have is that Otiko is here. Uh, Paul Afogu, I'm told he's around. We've not seen him yet. I've been uh, trying all I can to get through to him, but I'm told he doesn't want to be seen yet. He's seeing the grassroots people. The delegates, you've seen them uh, in, in their various uh, hotels and various houses and homes that they are to convince them before he comes out for people to see him. And he's supposed to be here today. That's officially, he's supposed to be here today. Uh, there are others too. Um, uh, for Governor Japan, his people were here yesterday. He started mounting his billboards, his uh, banners, and all. They, they have all started doing something. But for now, tomorrow, today and tomorrow, it's when we will expect all of them, all, all of the big shots here. Today, uh, from today to tomorrow, we are expecting all the candidates to arrive. Yeah. Mm. So maybe later on in the afternoon, we might get information. Because the, the, the regional chairman also told me that he's going to get some information for me as to who is arriving today and who is arriving tomorrow. And then we'll know we'll be in the position to get here, give you who is here and who is not. Germany. I see. How about security? Security, I, I, yesterday they had a meeting, and uh, uh, as you already know, we brought that to our viewers. Um, everything has been decided. They have firmed up everything, and security, I said, it will be very, very tight. Mm. Uh, they are going to be um, scanned in all, uh, at all the gates that will be open. Or everybody entering uh, the stadium, even though you go through the manual search, you go through a scanner too to check whether there is something... Uh, that uh, um, something that illegal, that, that as they term it, and the uh, supporters that do not have accreditation uh, or the delegates or those that are not delegates are not going to be allowed into the stadium. They are they are going to be about uh, 100 meters away from the stadium. That's where they will mount their barricades, and then they will put um, a, a giant screen outside for those who are unable to get into the premises to be able to watch it or monitor it and follow the proceedings what is going on in there so security is very very tight both the army and the police are all involved and the npp own internal security has also been beefed up and they are trying to make everything uh, um, uh, successful Kemeni. i see thank you very much ima for that information emmanuel Lanter joined us from tamale from where we'll bring you the live coverage of the NPP National Delegates Congress. In Tamale, people are on the edge about uh, circumstances surrounding the accident that uh, the, the, the accident involving aspiring General Secretary for the NPP, Kwapena Ejapon. Here in Accra, we are told that uh, uh, the man is not in danger.
You're watching News Desk. I'll be right back. Now, reports reaching us indicate some transport operators have started charging new fares following increase in the fuel price. The Ghana Road Transport Coordinating Council this week rejected reports it has increased fares by 10%. Now, the, the idea for the program this morning that for, was for us to explore, find out if indeed that this has happened, because we've not had any official announcement. Other reports also, in, in a rebuttal from the GRTCC, says that no official report has come out as to how much, by what percentage we should have our fares go up. Here we are, our fares have gone up. And nobody from the GRTCC is available for comments. How do we run the country like that? For how long are we going to see this, this happen? How long are we going to have our affairs go up and, and we won't have an official statement from the mother body of the Roads and Transport Coordinating Council? How does it work? We hope that by afternoon they'll join us on the midday midday news and then give us an update on exactly what their meetings since last week have yielded till now. You and I are confused. We, we, we patronize transport services every time, every, every other minute for, to our workplaces, to our various destinations. And the drivers who, who feel their businesses are being affected have decided to go up on their own fares. Yet the GRTCC won't comment for us to know what is going on. Isn't it sad? how this is being done. Anyway, on Facebook, Diva Lloyd Ampofu says, yes, it's a, uh, yes, please, it's about 10 pesos to 20 pesos. Meanwhile, Zakli Stanza says, it has also hit the Volta region. Fares from Tamale to Kumase have increased by five cities, according to Pius Imoro. Alfred Asiwame Ababio, Ghanaians only have a say when it's time for elections. After that, our views does not matter any longer. Peter Soka says the drivers are charging high fares too much. GPRTU must put measures in place to regulate the activities of these drivers. Those measures, we are unsure if they have been put in place or not. The drivers have taken the law into their own hands. And in fact, can you blame them? The, the fuel price has gone up, it's affecting their business, and it's taking forever for us to come up with uh, new fares to be charged. And now we are being charged whatever the driver feels right. Who does that? Anyway, hopefully by afternoon they'll change their minds and talk to us. Thank you very much for staying on News Desk. My name is Kemini Nyamani Amano. I'll see you again on midday on News Today. Goodbye.